get us started for today, I uh, would we'll, um, like to invite the Director of the Center for Human Rights, Professor Franz Fiyun, to um, give us um, a welcome address and to also introduce us to the house rules that we apply for the duration of this webinar. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, uh, Felucio. Um, and again, welcome to everyone who is uh, here today. We uh, welcome all our participants. We also say a special word of welcome to uh, the representatives from the three institutions. Um, we say welcome to uh, Commissioner Abomo from the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, a member of the commission. We say welcome to uh, the registrar of the African Court on Human and People's Rights, Dr. Robert Eno. We also say welcome to members of the um, secretariats or staff from the commission, Mr. Menzan, and also uh, Ms. Um, uh, um, Adyam Zemenfes, apologies, from the Committee on the Rights of the Child. We really appreciate you being with us and um, also sharing your insights and also your time with us. I also welcome Dr. and Professor Rachel Murray, uh, who is uh, our partner uh, from the Human Rights uh, Law Implementation uh, Project at the University of Bristol. Uh, she will also talk a little bit about this project and contextualize the work that has been done uh, in uh, that framework and link it to our event today just after, after me. So um, I think it is common cause that the previous century has been known as the uh, the age of human rights. After 1948 Universal Declaration, there was great enthusiasm about human rights and what could be achieved. But to some extent, the 21st century became the century of uh, skepticism and questioning of human rights. In my view, much of that questioning and skepticism goes hand in hand with the focus that we've seen in the 21st century on the implementation of human rights. As much as standard setting was really the norm uh, in the initial phases of the Human Rights Project, we've seen this move towards much more serious engagement on the actual implementation of human rights norms, standards, and decisions. And with that, we have seen, uh, if you like, a pushback, uh, also uh, perhaps greater engagement, but also uh, more criticism, more uh, challenges being uh, raised by, by states, by state parties, because of the very fact, I think that human rights actually became a currency that mattered more in the, in the real lived lives of, of people. So it is this impetus, this so, focus okay. that I think we uh, pay our attention to today. And uh, we, have invited the same and we look time. forward to hearing the perspectives of uh, representatives of the three this one, I don't uh, understand. human rights Causing the institutions uh, within the African Union, the African Commission on Human People's Rights, the African Court, on human people's rights and the committee on the rights of the child. We look forward to uh, the representative sharing with us the um, priorities, the uh, challenges, and maybe some perspective of uh, the way forward for these institutions in terms of uh, this very important issue of implementation linked obviously to follow up within these institutions. As Felucio said, uh, we have these proceedings recorded and live streamed. We ask that you retain yourself um, muted. We will have the presentations and thereafter, we will uh, invite um, participation through questions in the first place. So as we go along, please, please add your remarks, your comments and your questions in the chat box. We will um, take those as the starting point for our discussions and our engagement once the speakers have given their introductory remarks. Let me also, as a starting word, just thank everyone who made this event possible. Perhaps at the very end, we'll come back to this issue. We wish us all a good, insightful two hours together. Thank you once again for being with us today. Thank you very much, um, Trofeon. And um, now we will um, have um, Professor Rachel Murray, um, the director of the Human Rights Law Center, University of Bristol, to introduce us um, to the projects that um, is sort of the impetus for our webinar today. 
um, it will be, she will introduce us to the project and also give us an overview of the human rights law um, implementation project. Prof Murray. Thank you, uh, Belusho, um, and, and thank you to the, the Centre for Human Rights um, for this collaborative work and to you all for, for making time today. Um, I'm just going to say a few brief words about the Human Rights Law Implementation Project, which has sort of prompted this webinar. Um, this was a project that we um, got funding for from a UK uh, research council, the Economic, Social and Research Council, and it was a project in collaboration with the Centre for Human Rights in Pretoria, as well as two other universities in the UK, Essex and Middlesex, and with the Open Society Justice Initiative. And I know some of you on this call, we engaged with you during that project, which started in 2015. And the purpose of that was to look deeply at what happened at the national level once decisions and judgments are adopted by regional or international courts and commissions. So we looked across Africa, the Americas and Europe, and we selected um, three states within each of those um, systems. Um, and then we looked at a handful of decisions um, and judgments from the respective uh, regional bodies or the UN treaty bodies. Um, and then we tried to um, interview as many people as we could, hold a series of workshops, data gathering and so on, to try to see if the specific reparations and recommendations made by those supranational bodies had actually been implemented. So if, for example, the African Commission called on the government to uh, adopt legislation or release an individual from detention as a result of a finding of violation in the communication, we then tried to see if that had actually happened, how long it took and what the challenges um, were in trying to get that achieved. Um, We've published a series of papers, academic and other policy documents and so on, which are on our website, which I'll put on the chat function so you can see the link to it. But I just wanted to flag up um, a couple of things. Um, this is not the only thing we found, but a few things that I think might be particularly relevant for the discussions today. Firstly, what we saw is that implementation is rarely, if ever, automatic. So I think the presumption sometimes is that if the state has political will, then these decisions and judgments will be implemented. Um, but actually political will is not necessarily a very helpful concept when you look at the complexities of the procedures and the actors involved um, to implement these particular reparations and recommendations. Um, just to take what is often considered to be a sort of easy um, recommendation to implement, and that is the payment of compensation. Um, now, there are various challenges with if that amount is not set, if the quantum is not set by the supranational body, then you need a process at the national level to determine what that amount should be. Um, but more importantly, often what we saw, and this is across not just the African um, system, but also in Europe and the Americas, when you get down to the domestic level, there may be no clear process by which that compensation is paid. So the international decision or judgment doesn't necessarily trigger in the same way that a national court judgment might, a domestic process for the payment of that compensation. And so in some instances, what you find is the individual victim or their legal representatives then having to, um, as one person said to us, run around trying to find uh, who they should speak to within government, within the treasury and, and so on. And exactly what the process is to achieve the payment of compensation. And that's not necessarily because the state authorities don't have the political will or desire to comply with these decisions. It's just that the mechanisms and processes and bureaucratic procedures may not always be in place. In addition, where you have recommendations and reparations which are addressed to the independent um, elements of the state, such as the parliament, the legislature or the judiciary or so on, 
So if, for example, one of the recommendations or reparations is that legislation be adopted or amended or um, an individual be released from uh, custody or prison, for example, then you're requiring what in effect are independent arms from the executive to carry out the actions um, ordered by a supranational body. And again, that domestic trigger, um, that local rule or piece of legislation which enables those bodies to do that may not always be in place. And yet the overall conclusion may be, well, the state hasn't complied. They haven't amended their legislation. This individual hasn't been released. But what we saw was when you're trying to understand why that hadn't happened, often it's because those uh, particular rules or procedures or bureaucratic um, requirements are not there at the domestic level. Um, one other point just to make is what we heard from many um, state authorities and the parties to the case was that what was often useful post decision and post judgment was the ability to have a dialogue with each other and also with the supranational body themselves. Sometimes either to determine exactly what is required to implement or to work out the finer points or the time frame by which um, they should do so. And sometimes that ability or that space to have that dialogue may not always be um, obvious. Um, and lastly, the point I want to make is about visibility. What we saw, particularly in the countries that we looked at in the African continent, um, was that the visibility of not only the decision or judgment, but also the mechanisms by which um, those reparations should be implemented, um, and as well as any measures that the government or other state authorities had taken to implement that decision, were often not known, even among government authorities or those that you would presume would be aware of these decisions. Um, those processes, the judgment and any measures that the state had taken may not be visible. We had to do, we had time, we had years to dig into looking at some of these decisions. Um, and some of the decisions we were looking at were recent decisions. And still then it was quite difficult to find out precisely what had happened, even by talking to key people in state authorities. And as somebody uh, said to us, um, the state sometimes do, does good things, but they don't always tell, them, tell us about them for various reasons. So some of this information is hidden and not visible. Um, and so just in conclusion, I think obviously there are many pressing priorities on the human rights community, particularly currently. And there has been, I think, a shift away from looking at this issue, looking at implementation of recommendations and reparations um, and what happens post decisions. Is it still important? And I think what our research has shown is that absolutely it is. There has been quite a lot of improvements in terms of the systems, um, the responses of states over the past sort of five to 10 years, increasing recognition by government authorities about the need to set up national mechanisms to monitor these things. And victims have received reparations, um, they've received compensation, they've been released from detention. So it's important for them. But I think just to conclude, it's also crucial, and we were told this many times, that it's important for the treaty bodies themselves, for the courts, for the commissions, um, that for their own credibility and legitimacy, that they are able to show that their decisions, um, the recommendations they make, the reparations they order, have been respected by the state. And our findings show that actually more, we, more than you would think, um, those recommendations and reparations are being considered. It's just not always as visible. That's not to recognize, that's not to um, acknowledge that there are lots of challenges. But one of our interesting findings was we found more um, implementation than we expected. So I'm going to end on that positive note and hand back to the chair. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you very much, Prof. Murray, for this succinct introduction and overview.
Um, just before we proceed, I would like to inform our audience that um, this webinar is being recorded in English and um, it's been um, conducted in English and in French. And um, I would want us to you know, um, choose a specific channel, either English or French and mute original audio. So in that way, um, if you want to listen to us in French, you can understand when the person is speaking English and vice versa. Thank you very much. And I hope um, that instruction is clear. So um, we'll move now to um, the panel discussion. And um, so I will just give a quick um, overview of how this will work. I think Prof. France already um, gave us um, a brief explanation on that. So we will have the panel discussion. Um, we'll have four panelists, two from the um, African Commission on Human and People's Rights, one from the African Court, and then one member of the um, one person from the African Committee of Experts on the Right and Welfare of the Child. So after their presentation, the panelists will present for 15 minutes each. Um, we'll have the question and answer session. So the question and answer session will essentially um, be that um, be taken from um, questions that are posed in the chat box during the presentation by the panelists. So we encourage you to put your questions in the chat box when the panelists are making their presentation. And um, after the question and answer session, which will be facilitated by Professor Richard Murray and Mr. Michael Ayako, they will pick the questions and they will read out to our panelists. So uh, please make your questions very succinct and very explicit. And after that, we will have a recap by the panelists, um, two minutes for each of them to essentially give us maybe additional information or just um, their final words as regards this presentation. So I will introduce our four panelists now. Um, our first um, speaker will be Honorable Mary Louise Abomo. Um, Honorable Abomo is a commissioner of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. And she's um, also the vice chairperson of the African Commission's Working Group on Communications. Um, our second speaker will be Mr. Bruno Menza. Um, Mr. Bruno Menza is a legal officer in the Secretariat of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Then after that, um, we will listen to the presentation of Dr. Robert Eno, um, who is the registrar of the African Court on Human and People's Rights. And um, the last but not the least, we'll have our present, um, the presentation of Ms. Adiam Zimenfis, who is the child rights legal researcher at the Secretariat of the African Committee of Experts on the Right and Welfare of the Child. Like I said, um, our panelists will present for 15 minutes and then we'll move to the question and answer session. So um, now we'll start the panel presentation with um, the presentation of Honorable Mary Louise Abomo. Commissioner, we are pleased to have you. Thank you very much, Mr. Felucho, for giving me the floor. And indeed, uh, my name is uh, Marie-Louise Abomo. I'm commissioner of uh, the African Commission on Human Rights, the Human and People's Rights. But uh, I am here in my capacity as a vice chairperson of the African Commission working group on communications and it is a great great pleasure for me uh, to be uh, present here today and uh, given my capacity i will focus more on the issue of communication and uh, mr uh, Menzan, who is the legal officer in the Secretariat, will complete my presentation, especially since uh, the decisions of the court uh, do not only stop uh, at uh, decisions handed on communication mat related matters. Thank you. And based on Article 45 of the African Charter, the, the African Commission on Human Rights has uh, the responsibility to promote and protect human rights on the continent. And my presentation will therefore be focused on that uh, protection mandate, as well as the implementation of decisions uh, made uh, by the commission uh, 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 and in matters related to her. In uh, the execution of uh, this uh, protection mandate, uh, the commission receives uh, complaints from uh, 
various uh, uh, person and uh, this uh, the processing of these decisions uh, leads to recommendations uh, that are to be implemented by uh, the various states uh, to this day the commission has received 756 communications uh, and uh, including uh, in the intrastate communications and uh, there are several cases that were referred to the African court. The commission does not have to this day statistics on uh, the rate of implementation of uh, the uh, uh, decisions made and submitted to her and uh, this is due to the fact that uh, parties to communications hardly ever submit reports. Uh, however, it has observed that uh, the level of implementation is very low in terms of uh, decisions handed down. My presentation will be uh, structured in three parts. The first one would be what I would call the strategies, uh, the implementation strategies of uh, the Commission, and the second part uh, will be in related to the reasons for these strategies, and thirdly, I will have then a part on recommendations. And now, on the first part, in order to uh, meet the challenge of uh, leading to the implementation of decisions related uh, to the protection of human rights, the Commission implemented a number of strategies over the years. We have, uh, namely, the establishment of uh, a working group on communications, we can be considered as uh, the structural fem framework. And uh, this commission was established uh, based on uh, resolution 194 to 2011 for the implementation of the decisions of the commission. The responsibilities uh, of uh, uh, this uh, commission, uh, which was established by the resolution 2012, were improved uh, over the years. And uh, in addition to the establishment of this working group uh, and uh, also uh, after the various workshops that highlighted a number of uh, uh, weaknesses in the implementation process, the Commission moved to the revision of uh, its uh, rules and procedures in 2020 and uh, there are a number of improvements uh, related to that and i will mention as an innovation the submission of a report on the execution on on the demand of the commission what does that mean so based on rule 125 of the rules and procedures of 2020 uh, within a certain deadline uh, these reports uh, based on the notification. This report is uh, then uh, uh, represents a commission to the defense. That means once uh, the decision has been made and uh, no, the state party has been notified that the commission is expecting a expects a report and such a report is communicated to uh, the other party. And uh, the defending state may be invited to, to submit additional information on uh, measures uh, taken to react to the decision. It was done so simply because uh, this did not, did not exist in uh, the rules and procedures of 2010. And uh, the rapporteur of the commission is then uh, tasked with uh, the follow-up uh, of the measures taken by the states to implement the decision of the commissions. Uh, he may then inquire on uh, the various steps. And uh, for that, uh, we have uh, paragraphs five and six of uh, rule 125 or 2020. And uh, based on these uh, reports, the commission has also decided to involve uh, national institutions specialized in human rights matters to follow up on the implementation of decisions. It is therefore important to mention that uh, many workshops when then organized and uh, in view to uh, share on the implementation of decisions related to human 
rights and follow up on the decisions of the African court. And uh, the second one refers to the various bodies put in place uh, to follow up on the implementation of decisions. And this enables the commission to uh, inquire uh, and uh, to obtain information for East Activity Report uh, for uh, Article 154 of the African Charter, and uh, those uh, relates uh, to uh, the behavior of states which uh, relate to the non-compliance with the de decisions. And this relates uh, to uh, paragraph eight and nine of uh, Rule 125 of the Rule mm -hmm. and Procedures. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Commission, uh, uh, he also uses uh, uh, the commission also uh, sits on decisions that have not been implemented by uh, state parties. Why does uh, did the commission uh, make such a decision or bring these innovations? And regarding the involvement of the various entities and institutions, the strategies adopted by the commission are founded on the various roles of institutions and entities involved for the improvement of the implementation of decisions made by the commission. Regarding state parties, it must be reminded that by ratifying the African Charter, states voluntarily made a commitment based on Article 1 to implement the decision uh, with goodwill. And this commission reminds constantly the states that this uh, responsibility, which uh, relates to the protection of human rights. In, in the event of a violation of these rights protected by the Charter, the commission invites the states uh, to uphold uh, these uh, commitments. And uh, <laughs> Uh, regarding NGOs, the Commission is uh, very happy with the guidelines uh, which were produced uh, in terms of the follow-up of uh, the implementation of decisions by uh, the African uh, courts. And this evokes the various strategies that may be used to promote the implementation of decisions by regional organs. Regarding NGOs, their role in the follow-up of the implementation of decisions is just as important and vital in this, is, given the fact that the various violations of these human rights are, uh, occur in uh, these various countries where they operate. So they are considered a party in the communication process for the follow-up of uh, the implementation of decision based on the rules or, and procedures. And this enables uh, the follow-up uh, uh, with uh, the states uh, in terms of uh, the implementation of decisions uh, related to communication matters. What are the objectives? I would say that there is one, a gener an overall objective which is efficiency and efficiency of decisions handed down by the Commission in terms of its protection mandate. This objective relates to the observation made by the Commission and Professor Muriel mentioned it, which relates to the corrective measures adopted in the face of situations that have been established. And uh, uh, we are referring here to the lack of political will to implement uh, decisions. And next to that, uh, we can uh, mention budgetary budget constraints, which uh, of course hamper efforts by states to implement decisions. We can also mention uh, the lack of national mechanism as well as uh, national um, legislation, country legislation, to uh, aid in the implementation of these uh, decisions. Also, the, we, would, we can mention the lack of clarity in terms of uh, the decisions, uh, as well as the recommendations to remedy the, the violations. Uh, we can also mention the lack of uh, database to help in the follow-up uh, of the implementation of these decisions. There's also the lack of mechanism from the African Union 
to uh, supervise, oversee the implementation of decisions, as well as the lack of guidelines to help uh, the various parties in uh, supervising the implementation of decisions. To remedy all these issues and uh, to arrive at the spontaneous implementation of the decisions and taking into consideration the various recommendations by the human rights bodies, it this requires um, a will by the state and the mobilization of the various uh, stakeholders uh, which hold a privileged position and uh, the commission recommends therefore that uh, to the state parties to uphold uh, their uh, commitments and to implement the decisions of the commission and to put in place a national mechanism for the implementation of decisions to facilitate the coordination of uh, this implementation and uh, establish a special fund to that uh, end uh, or for that purpose. And uh, uh, refer, another recommendation would be to revert to the guidelines related to the implementation of decisions by regional bodies and uh, to uh, participate in the implementation of the recommendation of the committee or the recommendations of the commission and to regularly update the commission on uh, the progress uh, in the implementation of these decisions and uh, to put in place uh, also a follow-up mechanism for the implementation of uh, decisions and uh, the uh, uh, the implementation of these decisions uh, helps not only to improve the efficiency of uh, uh, the legal bodies, but to improve the human rights uh, situation globally. And uh, we also call upon uh, the states uh, to uh, uh, respect uh, the commitments uh, that they have made in terms of uh, the implementation of uh, decisions. Uh, failing that, uh, these decisions uh, will then be reduced uh, to reduce to declarations, uh, empty declarations, despite uh, the various uh, uh, decisions and uh, the content of the rules and procedure. Thank you for your attention. Huh? Thank you very much, um, Commissioner Abomo, and um, thank you for that wonderful presentation. I would. Merci, like Madame la Commissaire. Um, I would just like to tell our speakers that um, because our interpreters are interpreting both in French and English. You can just um, paste down your um, the um, your speech so that our interpreters can catch up with you. Thank you very much. So um, at this point now, um, we will invite Mr. Bruno Menza um, to give us his presentation on the implementation of decisions of the African Commission from the perspective of the Secretariat. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Facilitator, and thank you very much uh, for uh, the organizers of this uh, webinar on the implementation of decisions uh, by uh, human rights bodies of the African Union. And uh, I am here in my capacity as a representative of uh, the interim secretary of uh, the commission who could not be here to participate in this important event. And she therefore extends her apologies for her absence. And uh, following the brilliant presentation by uh, Madam Commissioner Abomo, I would now like to share the perspective of the Secretariat on these uh, issues of the implementation of uh, the decisions of the Commission uh, uh, in uh, connection with uh, communication matters. As uh, she mentioned, it's not only about uh, in, in terms of uh, um, litigations that these decisions are made. There are also resolutions and uh, other observations. This is a, a general issue that are faced by the Commission in the sense that uh, if your work is to mean uh, something, it must be implemented. And uh, if the objectives are not uh, achieved, your uh, objectives will therefore be uh, uh, affected. 
so of course, uh, the presentation by the Honorable Commissioner uh, will, uh, of course, uh, uh, adopt it as well. Uh, because we cannot necessarily uh, talk about uh, implementation strategies on uh, communication related decisions because uh, there is no specific rule that states that uh, to arrive uh, at that implementation, we will proceed uh, uh, step by step. Um, there is no such rule and uh, this is, uh, has been long overdue and the, 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 the time is right to have uh, such a, a rule. And this is a very important point to highlight. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there are a number of aspects mentioned by the Honorable Commissioner, which can uh, be a basis upon which uh, to uh, formulate a strategy. And uh, this relates to the normative uh, framework uh, related to the rules and procedures of uh, 2010, which is now known as uh, the 2020 rules and procedures of the commission. The innovations were mentioned uh, by uh, Madam Commissioner, um, not notably Article 125 in terms of the various aspects that were not taken into account in the previous rules and procedures which are now included. I would now not want to come back on uh, to mention them again because they have been mentioned. And uh, we also have uh, the implementation of communication related decisions by the commission that uh, she is a member of. And the third uh, item would be communication sensitization and uh, also diplomatic uh, actions. Uh, so this is one the strategy that the commission uses to uh not only arrive at the situation that is such that when um, it formulates the strategies for uh communication it achieves uh, uh objectives uh, that may lead to the implementation of these decisions. So uh, there is uh, work that is done on an ongoing basis to gather data from uh, institutions. Normally, the Commission communicates uh, with the state through the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. And this Ministry of Foreign Affairs then has the responsibility to convey the recommendations uh, to the various institutions, uh, relevant institutions in uh, the various states. Each state has um, its uh, own way of functioning. We started with uh, justice ministries and ministries in charge of human rights issues. Uh, the, briefly, ministries that are responsible for human rights issues. And we also implemented a number of workshops, training workshops, to help partners assess the situation and adopt uh, corrective measures to improve the implementation of decisions. There is therefore a, a mix of various actions undertaken by the Commission to achieve uh, its objectives. There is a fourth element that uh, I would uh, probably uh, uh, mention with uh, three interrogation marks. They are related to the rules and procedures and the charter. At uh, Article 34, it is uh, stated that uh, the Commission uh, submits uh, reports uh, uh, on its uh, decision to the various organs of the, uh, human, the African Union. Uh, and this uh, mechanism uh, enables these uh, bodies uh, to state that uh, uh, we have been given a mission uh, and uh, we have uh, completed that mission. And this is uh, the situation in terms of uh, implementation. We have uh, a number of challenges to, um, to uh, have states implementing these decisions. And uh, you, we all know that uh, states uh, do not want to be uh, pointed out, uh, printed at in public or accused of failing to implement these uh, decisions. 
So we need to establish certain contacts with the various authorities, the relevant authorities who may be able to influence uh, progress into the process of implementation. And uh, we have uh, reports uh, that are uh, drafted during public uh, uh, sessions of the Commission. And uh, they, we have seen uh, some in implementation that uh, uh, has started in certain cases. And uh, in these uh, public uh, uh, sessions, we uh, have uh, uh, participation by the parties and uh, also stakeholders. And this is uh, globally what the framework looks uh, like. I would also like to touch on uh, perspectives uh, 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 at the Commission in terms of how to resolve these issues. A number of recommendations were made after problems were identified. Uh, it must be mentioned that in the strategic plan 2021-2025 of the Commission, there is one aspect related to, to the challenges in the implementation of the decisions by the Commission. And uh, there are a number of uh, what I would call objectives uh, which are targeted in the implementation of these uh, decisions. This requires a number of actions to be undertaken. One, the establish a, a follow-up unit within the Secretariat of the Commission. This is an important progress, and I think that should be possible uh, during the restructuration of the institution of the, of the African Union. If you look at uh, previously, this uh, aspect was not uh, taken into account. Uh, there are a number of experts which were recruited uh, and uh, 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 to deal with issues of protection and, promo and promotion, but uh, this implementation aspect was not previously uh, taken into account. Well, initially, according to the state, uh, uh, these uh, uh, decisions, states assumed that decisions were to going to be implemented uh, willingly, but uh, that did not happen. So uh, that requires new strategies to uh, change uh, that uh, situation. So uh, this aspect is important, especially when uh, the capacity becomes available. And I mean, uh, the various communication with uh, communications with the various uh, uh, relevant authorities in uh, the countries to uh, help uh, the uh, beneficiaries uh, get uh, the uh, uh, results of the implementations of the implementation and uh, we also have uh, the capacity to uh, monitor and follow up on the implementation of uh, these decisions. Uh, um, oftentimes, uh, these uh, bodies do not have the resources and capacities to report to the Commission on uh, the state of advancement uh, of uh, the progress made uh, in the implementation. And in that same strategic plan, uh, there is a proposition to lend support to the states for the implementation of decisions. Practically speaking, Madame uh, Rachel mentioned it, uh, we do not know which institution is responsible for the implementation of the decisions of the Commission. I think uh, this is the kind of work uh, which can be done in collaboration with the states, uh, uh, which is to establish uh, if there is a mechanism or uh, institutions responsible for the implementation of the decision of uh, the Commission. If uh, these bodies are uh, standing bodies or permanent bodies, then of course uh, they, this should uh, facilitate uh, the work. And uh, we must also highlight that uh, in uh, African countries, uh, ministers change and uh, looking at uh, the various reports on the convention bodies, the treaty mm -hmm. bodies, we experienced difficulties to uh, uh, get uh, some of the reports. 
and uh, so we need uh, permanent uh, bodies uh, that uh, can follow up uh, on the implementation of uh, decisions uh, by the commission i believe that uh, i have uh, then uh, added the missing elements to the previous presentation and um, another thing uh, looking at the periodic uh, reports by the states the commission uh, has made a decision to urge uh, states and uh, depending on uh, the situation and the communications that have led uh, to uh, certain decisions that have not been implemented, we have made the decision to state clearly that the states have a responsibility to implement the decisions of the commission on uh, communications matters. And uh, I must say yeah. that, uh, uh, a lot of efforts have been deployed at the Secretariat uh, to uh, fill the gap uh, in the implementation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we undertook a number of study missions uh, in Costa Rica, in the Inter-American Court. And uh, we also had uh, communications uh, with uh, uh, institutions of that uh, court which uh, helped us uh, understand that uh, without implementation of court decisions, these uh, organs should not exist. So there are a number of examples as well around the world of uh, similar units which can help uh, the commission in uh, the uh, execution of uh, its uh, mission. This is the end of my presentation and uh, I am available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bruno, for um, that um, presentation and for complementing the information that um, has been provided by um, Honorable Commissioner Bruno um, from the perspective of the African Commission. So um, before we move to the next presentation, I would just like to make um, two quick announcements. So um, the questions, I got an email um, asking if the question should be sent to me. No, please. Um, the question should be posted in the chat box. So um, I hope that is clear now. And secondly, um, when you pick, um, we have to pick our language channel because we are using our interpreters. So if you leave your, um, if you leave it on the original audio, there, there are chances that you will have some feedback. So you pick your language channel and then you mute your original audio. So um, please, let's do that. Thank you very much. Now uh, that we have listened to the perspective of the African Commission with respect to the implementation of its decision, we will be listening to um, the second um, human rights body for today, which is the African Court on Human and People's Rights. And our speaker for that is um, Dr. Robert Eno, who, as I introduced previously, is the registrar of the African Court. Um, Dr. Eno, we are happy to have you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Modretto. Uh, thank you, Professor Franz and Professor Mure. I also want to recognize, uh, I saw one of my bosses, Honorable Justice Ben Saula is with us. Uh, the Honorable Vice President Justice Kyoko was uh, invited to speak, but uh, he informed me to express his regret to the organizers that he had um, a proud engagement, but has also instructed me to speak on behalf of the court. I'm therefore happy that uh, Justice Ben Saula is able to join us and I see a couple of colleagues from the court who have also um, joined in this discussion. So they are very welcome. Uh, I'm going to make a presentation on the measures that the African court has um, put in place to implement um, decisions of the court. And in my outline, I've tried to explain what constitutes a decision of the court. I've looked at the status of implementation of decisions of the court. Uh, I've looked at the possible reasons why so far there's a very low level of compliance with decisions of the court. And lastly, I'll look at measures that uh, may have been put in place 
to enhance compliance with the decisions of the court, looking basically at two main approaches, the treaty-based approach and initiatives that have been put in place by the court itself to enhance compliance with its uh, made decisions. Um, uh, for the Apologies. Um, would yes, you sir. want us to share your PowerPoint? Would you want us to share it on the screen or would you be doing that from your side? Uh, you can share it on the screen, but I also manage it from my side. Yeah, I think if you're managing it from your side, then you should share your screen so we can see your screen because your, um, your video is pinned at the moment for our audience. Okay, let, let me see uh, how it goes. Sorry? Yes, yes, um, just share from your end and... Okay, we'll so I say share and uh, let me see. Are you seeing it now? Yes, we are, thank you very much. Okay, okay, that's good, yeah. So, uh, the, the first is to the introduction in our new rules that was adopted in uh, 20, 25 September 2020, we have defined decisions of the court to mean any pronouncement of the court in the exercise of its judicial powers, which is in the form of a judgment, a ruling, an opinion, or an order. But for the purpose of this um, uh, presentation today, I'm going to limit myself to two of those decisions. That is judgment and rulings. And the rulings will be rulings on provisional measures. In the past, we used to call them orders for provisional measures, but the court decided that they should be called rulings on provisional measures. So um, uh, we are going to limit ourselves to judgments and the uh, rulings on provisional measures. And for the, um, uh, the, the nature of these decisions and the actions to be taken by the different stakeholders, are clearly described under articles 27 to 31 of the protocol. So that is what I'm going to focus on. Uh, the next slide looks at those provisions. Article 27 of the protocol provides that where the court where the court finds that there has been, uh, where the court finds that there has been a violation, it shall uh, provide for remedy, including compensation or reparations. Article 27.2 deals specifically with a situation where the court thinks there is extreme gravity or agency. And in this situation, the court can decide to order for interim measures while pending consideration of the merits of the case. Article 28.2 provides that the majority judgment of the court shall be final and not be subject to any appeal. 28.3 provides, however, that the court can review its own judgment and 28.4 provides that the court can interpret its own judgment. Article 29 of the protocol is very important. 29.1 provides that the judgment of the court shall be notified to all the parties. And 29.2 in particular provides that the Executive Council of the African Union shall monitor implementation of the judgment of the court on behalf of the assembly. This is a very important provision because this provides a basis for, the, for determining the implementation of the judgments of the court. 
Article 30 deals with execution and uh, states undertake to execute the judgment of the court in which they are parties within the time stipulated by the court and also undertake to guarantee the execution of those judgments. Article 31 is also very instructive. It requires that the court should report on its activities at each regular session of the assembly. And in particular, this section is very important. And in particular, report in cases where states have refused to comply with the judgments of the court. So these are the basic provisions in the protocol that determine um, the extent of implementation of um, the court judgment. But what is the status of compliance so far for the 15 years of the existence of the court? As you can see from the statistics, it is not good enough. Our 2020 activity report provides that only 7% of the judgments of the court have been complied in full. And this is only with respect to Burkina Faso. It's only Burkina Faso that have complied in full with the, with the two judgments um, against her. In 18% of the, of the cases, there has been partial compliance. And in 75% of the cases, there has been no compliance at all. As a matter of fact, some states have openly declared that they are not going to comply. And they didn't say this only to the court, they said this before the executive council, that they are not going to comply with the judgments of the court. This is with respect to judgments. With respect to rulings for provisional measures, the situation is even worse. I think so far we have only one country that reluctantly complied with the order for provisional measures of the court, and that was Ghana. Um, the majority of the states have submitted um, reports on compliance with orders for provisional measures, but their reports have been contested by the applicants. This includes states like um, Libya, Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, but in the majority of cases, they have not reported at all on the orders of provisional measures issued by the court. If you look at our 2020 activity report, you'll see the table there. And in almost all those cases, you indicate, we've indicated that there has been no report submitted. But what are the reasons? What may be the possible reasons why there has been poor compliance? At the court level, we have not undertaken any independent research to determine why there has been poor compliance. But in our interaction with stakeholders, the following have been revealed. The first is that as we speak, there is no monitoring compliance mechanism within the African Union system to monitor compliance with the court judgment. Yes, the protocol provides under Article 29.2 that the Executive Council shall monitor implementation on behalf of the Assembly. But the Executive Council has not put in place any mechanism to ensure this monitoring process. So there is nothing on which the Executive Council relies on to monitor compliance. Secondly, we have observed that there is a lack of understanding of what the decision of the court really entails. With respect to orders for provisional measures, we realize that some states do not understand what it really means. They do not understand that interim measures simply means that there should be a suspension of proceedings until the court deals with the merits of the case. As far as some states are concerned, interim measures mean that the state, the, the court has already decided on the merits. And this was the case with um, Tanzania, Ghana, Benin, and even Cote d'Ivoire, 
when they received our orders for interim measures, they, they jumped straight into the conclusion that the, the court has already taken decisions on the merits. And maybe that is what may have solicited the kind of reaction that they had. With respect to Tanzania, I was requested by the court to lead a delegation to meet with the Attorney General to explain to the Attorney General what we meant by interim measures. Because the court had taken a decision to systematically um, uh, adopt orders for provisional measures on cases dealing with the death penalty. So when the court issues an order for interim measures requesting the, the state not to proceed with execution, the Tanzania government thought that the court was challenging Tanzania's laws on the death penalty. Meanwhile, that was not the case. But when we had this discussion with the attorney general, they understood the meaning of interim measures and they took steps to be able to comply um, with some of the interim measures issued by the, uh, by the court. The same reasoning was advanced um, by Ghana when we issued an order for interim measure to respect to a death penalty case as well. The third issue we have found is that uh, uh, there is a lack of understanding or a definition of the status of the court judgment. Is the court judgment a foreign judgment that has to be um, processed like a foreign judgment before it is implemented? Or is a court judgment a judgment that should be self-executing at the domestic level? This in some countries have not been clarified. So I think um, uh, um, Professor Murray raised this issue. What are the mechanisms that have been put in place in most domestic um, uh, jurisdiction to deal with judgments that come from the court? Does it need to be registered as a foreign judgment, go through the normal um, uh, domestic um, uh, processes before it is implemented? Or mechanisms should be put in place to ensure that when a judgment of the court is delivered and it goes to the domestic level, it should be, there should be direct execution. The ECOWAS um, court has a system whereby um, these judgments go to the domestic system and measures are there to ensure that they are Im immediately implemented. The East African Court of Justice has a similar mechanism in that regard so that the judgment of the court does not suffer the same procedure that a foreign judgment, for example, a judgment that has been delivered in the United Kingdom to be executed in Tanzania has to go through. But with the case of the, the judgment of the African court, there is no consistent standard across the African continent on how this judgment should be received and implemented. Another issue we have identified is that, um, uh, um, and this has to do also with the status of the judgment, there is a lack of the use of national mechanism to get judgments of the court enforced at the domestic level. We need a, a, a focal point at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or Ministry of Justice or Attorney General's office to be able to facilitate implementation of the judgments of the court. And one of the issues we identified also is the political will. I know Professor Murray um, has raised this issue of political will, and I agree, I agree with her that uh, it doesn't just boil down to political will. The political will may be there but there has to be processes in place at the domestic level to make reality that political will. But my view has been that uh, if that political will is expressed at the political and policy level, measures will be taken to ensure that the necessary steps that need to be taken to express that political will into concrete action has to be um, put in place. So to me, the issue starts with the political will to ensure that judgments 
are implemented. If there's a political will at the top, if the president gives the order, the prime minister gives the order, policies and the necessary measures will be adopted to ensure that the, the judgments of the court are implemented. So why political will is not everything, but to me, it is very crucial in driving the process forward. Uh, my next slide I mean, now deals with the measures that the court has put in place to enhance compliance. And these measures have been broken down into two. The first one is a treaty-based approach, which is the one that is contained in the protocol establishing the court. I've already alluded to the fact that Article 29 provides for the fact that the executive council shall monitor implementation of the court decisions, or court judgment on behalf of the, of the assembly. Unfortunately, the executive council has not put in place any such mechanism to do that. Article 31 of the protocol mandates the African court itself to report on its activities and in particular on cases of non-compliance. I can report here that um, at every session of the executive council, the court has been reporting on the status of implementation of its judgment. Um, uh, and this will report to the executive council. In the past, the executive council will adopt a decision on the activity report of the court, calling on states that have not done so to take measures to comply with the judgments of the court. I think this um, continued like that for a very long time until in January 2018, the Executive Council decided that no, it will no longer be mentioning in its decisions countries that have not complied with the judgments of the court. As far as the Executive Council was concerned, this approach of naming and shaming was not necessary. It decided to stop naming countries that have not complied with the judgment of the court. It, however, allowed the court to be able to mention these countries in its activity report. But as far as council was concerned, it refused to mention those countries in the decisions of council. The court tried to raise this issue to say that um, this approach will be contrary to the provisions of Article 31, but the Executive Council turned a deaf ear to that plea. The court itself has taken certain measures to ensure compliance with uh, its uh, judgments. The first one is to develop a framework for compliance and monitoring of court decision. And this was born out of the fact that uh, there was this lacuna in the monitoring system of the executive council. So the court decided to engage a consultant and we develop a framework for compliance and monitoring of court's um, judgment. This framework um, has eight steps um, uh, and engages all the different so, and I'm, yes, I'm, moderator. Uh, I'm afraid I have to interrupt you a bit. So um, your 15 minutes is up, but I know you still have a lot to tell us on your slide. So maybe you can just try to um, give us this um, information in the next three minutes. Thank That's you very right. much. Yes. So this, this framework contains um, eight steps, which um, uh, we have presented it to the STC for Justice and Legal Affairs and it is going to be submitted to the executive council for formal adoption. When it is adopted, um, this framework will become the, one of the legal instruments of the African Union on the monitoring of the judgments of the court. Uh, we are hoping that this will become effective uh, sometime this year. The next step the court has taken, the court has introduced in its new rules, a system where the court itself will engage in the monitoring of its um, uh, uh, judgments and decisions. Rule 81 and 82 provides for that and has introduced 
what we call a compliance hearing. If there's a dispute as to whether a particular judgment has been implemented or not, the court can invite the parties um, to make presentation before it in the form of a compliance hearing. And then the court will make a determination whether there has been compliance or not. And they will issue um, an order on the issue of compliance. The court has also established um, within the registry a monitoring unit um, to work with um, stakeholders to monitor implementation of its um, judgments. Um, uh, we are currently recruiting a senior legal officer for compliance and monitoring that will head that unit. Um, uh, this unit will be the first point of call for the implementation. When a judgment is delivered, this unit will develop an implementation template which will be sent to the parties together with a timetable on how the state is required to report on the compliance of the judgment of the court. And uh, lastly, we have uh, invited states to nominate focal points to work with the court. And uh, these focal points will liaise with the court with respect to a number of issues, including those that will be responsible for following up on the implementation of the judgments of the court. Unfortunately, only a few states have um, reacted, but uh, we are still working with them to ensure that we get all state parties to, to do so. And we are working closely with uh, stakeholders, including national human rights institutions, AU organs like the African Commission, Bar Association, the media, because these are uh, stakeholders from whom we can get concrete information on whether there has been compliance and they can also help in putting pressure on states to comply with our judgments. I will end here, but I uh, avail myself to answer questions and to provide more information if necessary. Sorry for the, for the timing. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Eno, and um, thank you for that wonderful and um, very detailed um, presentation. So I will just quickly tell our audience that if you want um, the PowerPoint that is being shared um, by Dr. Eno, you should please reach out to us. And um, also, um, once again, the recording of this webinar will be made available on the website. So um, if you have um, network issues, don't um, worry, you will have access to the recording um, after we are done with the webinar. So now that we have heard from um, Dr. Eno about um, the African court, we will be moving to um, the African committee and um, African committee of experts on the right and welfare of the child. And to address us on the implementation of the decision of this human rights organ is um, Ms. Adiem Zim Memphis, who is the child rights legal researcher at the Secretariat of the African Children's Committee. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Adem. I would like to listen to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to all. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Villion and Professor Murray for organizing this very important webinar. And thank you for also uh, inviting us. Um, sorry, am I able to share my screen? Because I don't think I, I think yes, the host you. should. You can share your screen if you want to. Um, the host should enable me to share the screen, but as that is being done, let me proceed in the interest of time to my presentation. Okay. Um, so the uh, African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child has uh, recently revised its... Uh, Ms. Adam, so uh, um, you have been enabled now. You yes. Can share yes. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Uh, so the, the committee has recently uh, revised its guidelines for the consideration of communications to include in its procedures in which the committee can monitor the implementations of its decisions. Uh, initially, the committee adopted an implementation hearing guideline, which was separate from the, its guideline for the consideration of communications. But while revising all of its working documents last year, the committee merged uh, the implementation hearing guideline into uh, its revised guidelines for consideration of communication. So this com guideline now contains all the procedures for uh, consideration of communications, but also 
implementation and monitoring the implementation of the decisions of the committee. So by decisions, the committee can uh, make decisions on the merits of a communication once a communication is uh, admissible. The committee can also uh, make a decision on provisional measures where there are uh, issues that are very urgent, that are very eminent, which needs uh, immediate action while the case is being concluded uh, at a merit stage. So in the meantime, the committee can also adopt a provisional measure. There is also a procedure for an amicable settlement, which somehow uh, needs a decision of the committee as well, even if the parties are um, the ones who have to agree about uh, the implementation or the alleged violation uh, on a communication. So I'll briefly highlight the various mechanisms in which the committee uh, attempts to monitor its implementation. According to the, the, the revised guidelines, the, once the committee issues a decision, then the state party which has received the decision is required to submit a report within 180 days after receiving the decision on the measures that it has, been, it has taken on the implementation of the decisions. When states fail to uh, submit a report within 180 days, then the committee can extend that with 90 days and give the state another notice to submit a report. Uh, this report, once received from the state, will be shared to the applicants uh, so that they are also informed about the measures that the state is uh, undertaking. The state is undertaking. So the first one is through this reporting mechanism that the committee monitors. Uh, the second one is the committee also held, uh, holds hearings, or we call them implementation hearings. Uh, this will be held whether or not a, a state party has submitted a report. So uh, even if we the committee does not receive a report from a state party on the implementation, it can still invite the state for an implementation hearing. Uh, the implementation hearing aims at allowing the committee to see the progress achieved by the state, the challenges faced, the various difficulties that the state party is, the, the respondent state is facing in terms of implementing the decisions of the committee. Applicants will also be involved, uh, invited to the, the implementation hearing procedure, and the committee, when it finds it necessary, it might invite the applicants to also make a reflection during the implementation hearing uh, to on the report of the state that has been heard orally uh, during the implementation hearing. And this implementation hearing will be held in an open session, so it's open for the public. And after the implementation hearing, the committee will, uh, the committee can then issue a guiding recommendations in which the committee might uh, provide further guidance to the states on how better the recommendations and the decisions of the committee can be implemented. Uh, the committee also has a procedure in which it uh, appoints one of its, its members as a rapporteur whenever it receives a communication. And that rapporteur is also tasked with uh, following up the implementation of the decisions of the committee. And whenever there is an issue that needs to be reflected before the committee, the rapporteur can uh, report during one of the sessions of the committee about the status of the implementation or the various challenges that are faced uh, at, uh, by the state. And uh, then the state can also, the, and the committee can also further uh, engage the state using that report of the rapporteur that has been appointed to deal with a specific communication. According to the rules of procedures of the committee, the committee is also mandated to, or the committee can also undertake a follow-up country visit. And a follow-up country visit can be done in various uh, contexts, including monitoring decisions of the committee. So after uh, two or three years uh, of um, uh, implement, uh, the, the, once the decision has been issued, then the committee can actually go on the ground into countries and engage with uh, various organs of the states to see what measures have been taken by states to implement the decisions of the committee on uh, complaints that have been received. When there is a lack of 
implementation of its decisions despite all the uh, implementation monitoring mechanisms that the committee uses and the committee still believes that there is lack of reporting or lack of implementation of decisions then the committee can bring this issue to the permanent representative committee and the executive council um, and report that there is lack of implementation by certain states uh, then the it, then it will be up to the executive council and the permanent representatives council to take whatever kinds of measures that they can take with regards to their rules of procedures the other one is um, the committee has also um, a state party reporting mechanism uh, outside in addition to the communications procedure so when state parties also come and report before the committee about the implementation of the charter in general uh, which is a very growing and a very encouraging uh, mechanism at the committee. Uh, the committee also raises the issue of implementation of its decisions uh, during the constructive dialogue and actually can uh, provide recommendations in its concluding observations with regards to the implementation of its decisions. Recently, uh, last year, the committee also um, established a working group on implementation of decisions. So the working groups uh, at the committee is a very recent uh, phenomenon. We've recently started establishing working groups. And uh, during the previous session of the committee, a working group on implementation of decisions has been established. The members uh, have been already identified and it will be operationalized in uh, starting from April 2021, so next month. Uh, another avenue where the committee tries to monitor implementation is uh, through its stakeholders, the civil society and the National Human Rights Institutes. So the committee uh, grants affiliate status to National Human Rights Institutes. And one of the, the, the roles of the National Human Rights Institutes that will be granted affiliate status by the committee is to assist the committee in monitoring the implementation of its decisions at a local level. So um, there are various opportunities at the uh, uh, within this monitoring mechanisms that are available in the committee. There has been an increased implementation hearing held by the committee during its sessions. The committee will have will be having its 37th session next, uh, starting from next week, and even during the next session, the committee will be having an implementation hearing uh, from the uh, from the government of Cameroon. We've had implementation hearings from Senegal, Mauritania in previous sessions, and this trend has been an increasing uh, trend where we invite uh, countries uh, to uh, report before the committee about the status of implementation of a decision that the committee has issued uh, against that state. So this is an, 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 an opportunity where there is a, a growing or increased trend of uh, getting a positive feedback from states also to come and present uh, about the, the status of implementation of a decision. And the report of uh, this implementation hearing will be a very public document, will be part of the session report, so it will be widely circulated. The committee has a very rich interaction with states and it will be in a kind of um, a constructive dialogue format rather than an adversarial format. So it's more encouraging for states to come and report because they will also be appreciated about the measures that they have been uh, taken. They will also get positive feedback from the committee about the positive measures that they can further take to enhance implementation. So there is an encouraging trend in that regard. The, the Some of the challenge, there's of course lack of uh, time to there is a lack to get um, timely response for reports when states are uh, required to report so the 180 days usually is not complied with uh, they we don't get reports from states uh, within that specific time within the prescribed time sometimes we don't even get any report there is also a lack of response to get from countries when it comes to invitation for implementation hearings there is a bit of a challenge in that regard um there is of course lack uh, of uh, proper guidelines for specific remedies so the committee of course has a guideline for consideration of communications but it does not include 
uh, a very detailed uh, procedures by which the committee can uh, provide a very detailed and measurable decisions. So I, it has been raised earlier by the presentations uh, preceding that a very measurable, concrete and concise decision from uh, an organ is very pertinent when it comes to implementation. So in, our, in order to avoid that, we need uh, proper guidelines. Despite lack of proper guidelines, the committee has tried uh, its best to come up with very concrete and measurable um, decisions. Of course, also even trying to identify which kinds of organs can actually implement the kinds of decisions that the committee is making. There is also a um, lack of coordination among uh, the committee and the National Human Rights Institute, despite the fact that we have uh, guidelines for affiliate status. We don't have any National Human Rights Institutes that has applied for uh, the affiliate status. And there is also the, one of the main factors, I would say, is shortage of resources, both at the committee and both at the state's level. So when a, a decision is issued, the decision might be a very cross-cutting decision that might require coordination among the various organs of the state to implement that specific decision. Maybe one or specific one organ may not address the decision if a violation is a very cross-cutting one. And that kind of coordination requires a technical as well as financial resource, both at the state's level. And it also requires a resource from the committee, from the secretary to be able to monitor at a very regular basis. And that also uh, adds up to the lack of um, uh, willing or political will that has been flagged over and over, and I don't want to repeat that. Uh, on the way forward, I think uh, it's all it's very important that uh, all the organs, including the committee, come up with measurable decisions for easier implementation. And it's important that we use all avenues of engagement with the states, including follow-up missions, including uh, state party reporting mechanisms, all the engagements uh, that are available uh, at the committee uh, to um, push for implementation of decisions. And it's also very important to enhance constructive engagement with states. The way states perceive a certain organ would definitely affect the way the decisions of that organ will be implemented. So the more we have a constructive engagement, and that's what we're trying to do at the committee, the more it will be easier for the committee to actually push states to uh, to implement because they will understand that the committee is coming from a very constructive perspective. And that is uh, what we've observed because there is more uh, willingness to implement the recommendations of the committee that are issued through its state party reporting mechanisms because there is a very constructive process that is uh, involved. Then to increase the visibility of the committee is also one very important point that needs to be uh, highlighted because as I've said, the decisions might involve various organs and not all organs of the state are aware about the, the committee, its mandate, its function and how it works and how the decisions should be implemented. So that visibility, increasing the visibility of the committee among all various organs of the state by engaging states more is very crucial. Collaboration among various organs, among the three organs is also very important. And that has been highlighted by Dr. Eno earlier because we can push one another among our various um, mechanisms to push states to implement decisions of the various organs. But I would also uh, finally like to stress on the role of the applicants uh, on monitoring implementation. Usually when applicants submitted communication uh, it's, there is a, a tendency that that's the end of it, but that's just the beginning and the implementation is the very crucial part. And whenever civil society organizations, any kind of applicants uh, approach the, the, the organs, I think um, there should be a, an understanding that uh, monitoring the implementation should also be part of their, their role. Of course, there is no rule in that regard, but in terms of pushing the human rights agenda forward and in terms of seeing uh, progress in, in the implementation, there is also um, that issue that needs to be raised. So whenever a certain organ attempts to reach out to the committee and get a decision, there should also be a consideration that the monitoring the implementation of the decision 
uh, will will be also their role uh, so that the applicants should also assist uh, the committee and the other organs in terms of uh, ensuring that there is implementation. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. I, I hope I used my time efficiently. I was trying to be as brief as possible considering the time. So I will be available for any comments and questions that will be forwarded. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Adam, for your presentation. And um, in answer to your question, yes, you were very on time. And um, I think you managed your time efficiently. So thank you very much. And um, of course, like you said, um, we'll have one or two minutes for you to um, also provide a recap of your information. So now um, we move to the question and answer session. Um, I'm sure, um, I think I've seen a lot of uh, messages in the chat box. So now um, I will be calling on um, Professor Richard Murray and uh, my colleague, Mr. Ayako, to guide us through the question and answer session. Thanks, uh, Felicia. Um, I've been trying to uh, keep a track of the very many questions and comments and group them together for the uh, individual panelists to be able to answer. So I'm just gonna try and summarize as best I can the issues that have come up, um, but please do, if you think I've missed anything, um, please let me know. So I'm going to just summarize questions for the commission, questions for the court, and questions for the committee, and then questions for all of you. Um, for the commission, there were a handful of questions around referral to the court, how many cases, why so few, and what changes are now being brought in by the 2020 rules. Um, the questions around capacity in the Secretariat to uh, monitor implementation. Dr. Enno talked about the monitoring unit uh, in the court, but whether there was anything similar in the commission, and also questions around uh, the commission's uh, suggestions of engaging with um, focal points that, again, Dr. Enno uh, mentioned this with respect to the court, but it'd be uh, people wanted to hear about this with respect to the commission. Specific questions for uh, the court. Um, what criteria are used to determine the credibility of any source of information that you get on implementation? What collaboration uh, does the court have with domestic courts um, on this issue on implementation? Uh, the place of the Executive Council in Articles 80 and 81, some uh, of the rules of the court, some more information was requested on that. Whether the new measures and framework um, that has been adopted by the court will apply to judgments delivered before the adoption of its most recent rules of procedure. And then a question around um, the fact that the decision is final and there's no appeal. That was more to do with withdrawals um, of the um, Article 34.6 declarations, but just in case you wanted to comment on that. And then questions for the committee. Uh, there was a question about becoming a member of the committee and the criteria required. Um, a question around whether one rapporteur for follow-up was enough, what the terms of reference are for that rapporteur and any tools to facilitate their work whether the committee has any data or statistics on the rate of implementation, what happens after 180 or the additional 90 days if there's no report, no engagement, no hearing, and so on, and what engagement there has been by the Executive Council if the committee has reported on non-implementation to it. So has the Executive Council engaged with the committee specifically on this issue? And then just a handful of questions that I think are addressed to, to all of the speakers. Um, knowledge of the decision and judgment, uh, how you make uh, this information on compliance public, uh, whether nationals of the states know that these communication mechanisms exist and what is being done to increase awareness of them. Questions on the role of the media, civil society and others, what they can do to support implementation of these decisions. And then questions on what do you do, that the, the million dollar question, what do you do um, if the state fails fully or partly to implement? And some comments around use of sanctions, um, you know, is it sort of persuasive approach or much more sort of forceful 
um, what incentives or sanctions are required to, to um, encourage states to implement. And then a final question on transforming an international decision into a national decision and national strategies that can be adopted. Um, so I'll hand back to Felucio to chair this, this final thing and, and the responses from our, our um, presenters, but I hope that's captured most of the extremely rich dialogue and questions that have been uh, put in the chat function. Before you proceed, there was a, there's a final question that relates to the role of the African governance architecture and how these uh, body can utilize that you know, governance mechanism as a means of promoting uh, the implementation of their decisions. So if the panelists could also take a dig at that. Thank you, Michael. I think it came up when I was talking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. So I, I think um, we'll, we'll start with the questions that are specifically um, directed to each of the organs, and um, we will just take that in the order in which the panelists have made their presentation. So we'll start with the African Commission. Um, maybe uh, Commissioner Abono or Mr. Mezan would like to answer the questions that were directed to the Commission. Thank you, Mr. Facilitator. I would like uh, to uh, mention that uh, Mr. Marzan will uh, answer questions addressed to the Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Commissioner. Um, Mr. Marzan, would you want to answer the questions? Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Commissioner. I am uh, a bit taken aback. Uh, uh, I think uh, there are three questions addressed uh, to the Commission. The first one uh, regarding uh, referrals of uh, cases to the court and uh, what uh, has uh, changed in terms of uh, the new rules of procedure. The Commission indicated in its presentation that uh, there are three cases uh, that were referred to the court uh, and uh, various decisions were handed down in connection uh, to that. I'm not going to dwell too much on the various technical uh, uh, challenges experienced, uh, which is, uh, of course, essential to the complementarity between the two organs, uh, the two bodies. The difference between uh, the 2010 and the 2020 uh, rules of procedure, in 2010, uh, there were various uh, options for uh, referrals to the court uh, after the non-implementation of uh, measures. Uh, and also the non-implementation of uh, yes decisions, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes, please go ahead, yes. We, we have uh, interferences on the line. There's a microphone open. And uh, also flagrant cases of uh, flagrant uh, violation. We, we are experiencing interferences on the line. We have a microphone open. We cannot follow the speaker. There was a, a conflict of uh, equal uh, standing between uh, the two institutions. One did not understand uh, why uh, the other one uh, had to review certain decisions. This has caused a number of technical challenges, which led to a decision being taken by the commission, commission that uh, uh, cases uh, referred to the court uh, uh, should not be substantially reviewed by uh, uh, one of the institution. And we have article 129, or I should I say 130, of the rules of procedure, which uh, governs the conditions under which uh, referrals can be made to the court. Uh, we must obtain uh, the consent of uh, the complainant. Uh, 
that's one example. These are more or less what uh, it's about. Uh, obtaining consent by the complainant means that uh, they would have to agree that their case is referred to the court, but that is uh, on condition that the commission has not taken an important decision on the complaint. That means that it has not made a decision on uh, the acceptability of uh, uh, this uh, case. That's what I, I can say on uh, referrals uh, to the court. I think consultations will continue with the two uh, bodies in order to uh, render this uh, complementarity mechanism more efficient. And uh, follow-up uh, measures uh, with the court, as I mentioned in my presentation, the strategic plan 2021-2025 uh, uh, provides for the establishment of a unit responsible for the follow-up of uh, the implementation of decisions. And we hope that, uh, of course, uh, upon implementing the strategic plan, this unit will indeed be established. And uh, regarding uh, state party, state parties, uh, you know that uh, some of the issues are not uh, institutionalized in our various tastes. When you have a good working relationship uh, with a specific person who understands the process uh, and what is involved, and uh, then uh, there is a change, there is no institutional memory and uh, that requires a start over. Uh, so it's important for these bodies to be institutionalized and uh, not be affected by any uh, 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 government reshuffle or uh, any other change that may take place in a country. Um, I would also like to touch on uh, one of the issues uh, pertaining to the role of the media and civil society. I think the commission uh, would not be able uh, to do its work uh, without uh, stakeholders. And uh, uh, the decisions of the commission may only be made public after the adoption of the report uh, containing that decision by the executive uh, council and uh, the civil society has uh, that uh, responsibility to uh, make sure that uh, the general public uh, knows that uh, a specific state uh, was uh, fined uh, to have devolved on certain issues and uh, this type of pressure can force uh, states to intervene. And uh, I'm not going to touch on the, the other questions that I do not believe to be able to answer. Uh, but I, I wish to indicate that uh, primarily in the procedure, we uh, make certain decisions by default. Uh, for example, participation of uh, states in contradictory debates by these uh, bodies. Uh, once you have uh, a state that uh, does, has not participated in the debate and uh, based uh, on the various requests for submission, oh. interventions, and uh, etc., and uh, that have not been uh, adhered to, the various, uh, once uh, you have exhausted mm -hmm. all the steps uh, in the procedures, decisions uh, can then be made by default. And in that instance, it is very difficult uh, to go back to a state and say a decision was made against you by default. And uh, of course, uh, based on the principle of the charter and international law, this is how it should be done. But I think uh, there the are a number of actions that can be in, undertaken initially to ensure that uh, visibility, as my colleagues uh, from uh, the Child Rights uh, Committee, uh, to, 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 to change uh, 
the perspective on uh, these bodies uh, and ensure that they are no longer seen as uh, repressive uh, organs, uh, but rather as partners. And uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I will now give you back the floor, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much, Mr. Nelson, and um, thanks for addressing the questions. And I would just like to quickly say that um, we are um, running out of time a bit, so um, I would implore our panelists to um, brief um, to keep their answers to the questions as brief as possible, so that um, we can uh, finish um, within the next 10, 15 minutes, because I think we are literally um, out of time now. So we would move to the African court and um, Dr. Robert Eno, your brief answers, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Modreto. I'll go straight into the questions. Criteria to determine source. We do not have at the moment any clear criteria uh, the new rule simply provides that uh, the court can get um, information from credible sources. And these credible sources that we've been using so far include um, NGOs with observer status before the African Commission, AU organs, um, UN bodies, and uh, uh, bodies that have been working with the court like uh, Pan-African Lawyers Union, the Coalition for an Effective African Court. But of course, it is for the court to determine the credibility of the information that it receives. Uh, it will not just take any information and act on it. Yes, yeah, so, but I'm sure the monitoring units that we have developed is going to work out clear criteria to be able to ensure that uh, the credible sources are indeed um, uh, very reliable. Collaboration with uh, domestic courts. Uh, for the past uh, six years or so, we've been having judicial dialogue with um, uh, domestic courts. And some of the issues that have come up has to do with how to collaborate with uh, domestic courts um, to ensure the effective implementation of our judgments. This is still work in progress. We are developing quite a number of initiatives, including working towards the establishment of an African judicial network that will form a permanent forum of all national judiciaries on the continent. We are also developing um, a human rights course specifically for national judiciaries where some of these things can be discussed with them and uh, ensure that we network on uh, some of these issues um, uh, to ensure that we have a proper working relationship with domestic courts to understand what it means for them to be involved in the implementation of judgments of uh, national courts or for international courts rather. The role of the executive council, um, uh, we, we have um, uh, made sure that we put the executive council at the center of the implementation because in any case, the protocol provides that they are the ones to monitor implementation of our judgments on behalf of the assembly. So uh, the framework that we have developed is actually to assist the executive council to be able to do its work um, properly. There's a question on whether the new framework should be applied before um, uh, cases that were adopted before they come into force of the new rules. The new framework has not yet come into force, uh, but my sense is that uh, it will be applicable from when it is adopted. Uh, there is no indication as to when it is going to start, but uh, in terms of the retroactivity of laws, I don't see it being applied to cases that had been decided before the coming into force of the new rules or the entry into force of the framework. Uh, there was a question about withdrawals. 
I didn't quite get that one properly. I don't know whether Prof can uh, repeat it. But uh, since I have the floor, uh, if you allow me, I would like to speak to some of the general questions that were asked. Uh, the role of the media, we work with the media. We have already done a number of training, about uh, three series of training for media professionals. And we have established a database of uh, media that we call Friends of the Court, that report on the work of the court on a daily basis. And we monitor the reports that they, um, they put out on a daily basis. So if you go to our website, you see a section on the media on all the reports that um, the friends of the court have reported on the court. Uh, there was the issue about publicity. Uh, unfortunately, our judgments are not very publicized. We just put them on the website. We distribute them to member states. We send them to some of um, uh, those on our network, but we have not yet uh, developed your consistent dissemination. I think our communication unit is working on that, how to better use um, social media in disseminating our work. Uh, we are working with social and um, uh, civil society organizations closely um, uh, to be able to, to do this as well. Uh, what do we do if a state does not comply? Well, what we have at the moment is simply to report to the policy organs for the non-compliance. As I indicated earlier, we used to include this in the draft decision, but the executive council has decided that uh, the naming and shaming is not necessary. So we only include this now in our activity report and we publish our activity report on our website. Uh, the role of AGA, we are part of the AGA platform and I think what AGA is doing now is to play a central role in coordinating the activities of uh, not only the human rights um, organs, but um, all other organs of the AU. And I think uh, AGA has a very important role to play to disseminate our draft decisions, disseminate our judgments, and come up with its own report that um, it can actually show that um, this is a status of implementation of judgments of human rights bodies on the continent. Now that we have the subcommittee on uh, human rights, democracy and elections of the PRC, and uh, AGA is working very closely with this subcommittee. It is an avenue now for us to work with AGA, pass some of the concerns that we have through this subcommittee so that we can bring to the level of the policy organs. Uh, lastly, Mr. Moderator, I just want to raise something that was uh, said about sanctions. If you look at the framework that we have developed, we have tried as much as possible to not deal with the issue of sanctions, but rather to deal with incentives and a mechanism to provide technical assistance. Because we've realized that in some of these cases, states simply need some assistance to be able to implement the judgment of the court. So what we have done, we have put in place um, uh, certain incentives. We, we have proposed for the establishment of a human rights trust fund, whereby states that need assistance to implement the judgment of the court can access this fund, maybe to get consultants to develop policies to develop, develop programs on how to amend their legislation to be in conformity with the judgment of the court. We've also made provision for whereby certain organs within the AU, for example, the political affairs department, um, uh, the office of the legal counsel, AGA secretariat can be able to provide technical assistance to states that are willing to comply with the judgment of the court, but do not have the capacity to do so. The resort to sanctions is the last resort and it's something that we don't want to bring forward. We would rather want to see how to encourage states, provide them with incentives to see the extent to which we can move this forward without necessarily talking about sanctions.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Eno, and um, thank you for your insightful answers and also um, answering the general questions as well. So um, we will move now to um, Ms. Adam to um, quickly um, provide some answers to the questions that were directed to the um, committee. Thank you very much. Uh, one question was about whether or not one reporter appoint, appointing just one reporter uh, for a follow-up is uh, sufficient enough. Um, the committee has an option either just to appoint one reporter or uh, to form a working group, even just for one communication, depending on the issues involved. But um, uh, on top of that, as I have mentioned, the uh, committee has already established a working group on uh, monitoring implementation of decisions, which will be operationalized in April 2021. So I think that will also uh, enhance the, 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 the number of persons involved in terms of uh, implementation from the committees and the secretariat side. Uh, with regards to the issue of the data that, has, that was raised, the committee has not undertaken um, that kind of study where it has assessed uh, how much of its decisions have been implemented. So I'm afraid that we have um, a specific data assessing uh, this percentage of the decisions have been um, implemented or not. But uh, just to inform you, we also don't have much of um, a communications uh, that we've received. We have only received 18 communications so far, uh, and two of them have been merged. So in total, we have 16 communications that have been received so far. So. That's also uh, something we really need to work on in terms of raising awareness about the mechanisms. And this takes me to the question that was also raised about, uh, do people know about uh, these mechanisms and how do you raise awareness about the decisions of the committee? So in the recent times, we've uh, really engaged in undertaking and conducting workshops with various civil society organizations working on children's rights to inform them about the complaints procedure of the committee, and also to um, raise awareness about the monitoring uh, aspect of the implementation, the monitoring aspect of the implementation of the decisions of the committee. So that's a work in progress, but there is some sort of progress also in that regard that we've all already started cooperating with various civil society organizations and in partnership with um, uh, institutes that work uh, in the academia and also in research at a regional level. Uh, there were instances where we organized um, uh, workshops to raise awareness uh, about the complaints procedure. We also launched um, uh, recently um, uh, an online course which will be running every year about the complaints procedure, which also include, includes the monitoring aspects with the center uh, with, uh, with the University of Cape Town, the Dola Omar Institute. And um, we've also um, launched another course in 2020 with UNHCR. So we're trying our best to raise awareness. And uh, as I said, it's a work on, in progress and we'll continue doing the same. Uh, what happens when there is no report after 180 days? The committee uh, in its annual report then will flag the issue to the Permanent Representatives Council, as well as the Executive Council. So it's then up to those um, uh, policy organs to take further decision in that regard. And what, how the Executive Council interacts with the committee is uh, that it will issue a decision based on the annual report of the committee. So when the committee reports annually, then the Executive Council issues a decision on that report. So the way we try to report the issues is not in a very controversial manner, but rather asking the Executive Council to call upon certain member states that have not complied with the decisions of the committee, not only the decisions of the committee, but other urges of the committee, then we request the Executive Council to call upon these states to comply with the decisions of the committee. So that's exactly how it's reflected in the decisions of the Executive Council. So far, there hasn't been any further uh, measure that has been taken in terms of sanctions and everything. And as Dr. Eno mentioned, um, firstly, it's not up to the organs to 
put states into sanction. It's the duty and the responsibility of the policy organs. But the policy organs are also take those as a very, very last uh, measure and uh, constructive dialogue, uh, engaging states in a positive manner is given priority. So that's what we, and also the Executive Council is currently uh, focusing on it. But the decisions of the Executive Council are very public. They're found, so uh, the decisions on the reports of the committee are available uh, on the African Union website. Um, how we we um, reach out to the media, the public recently, we are revising our communication strategy and we are trying really to engage uh, media and civil society organizations when, we, when, when it comes to implementation. And honestly, there is a huge role that the media can play. When um, our decision um, on contemporary forms of slavery was issued, uh, just because there was a media report, it got a very huge value. There was uh, a lot of uh, move going on with that regard. So the role of the media is uh, not to be undermined. And we are uh, revising our communication strategy to engage the media more, to engage civil society more in terms of um, implementation uh, monitoring. Um, what do you do, the, 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 the one million... Uh, dollar question what do you do when all the system uh, fails as i as it has been in the, uh, it's the the political will of the state matters and all our decisions and our all our efforts are exerted to actually get a positive political will from the state to take uh, the decisions seriously and implement the decisions of the organs uh, of the committee so we try still, we, our effort doesn't stop even if the state is not responding uh, to our invitation to implementation hearings or our invitation uh, to report or even our request to go on the ground and undertake a country visit. So we keep on engaging the state despite uh, the fact that we may not get any response. And I think uh, what we should do further is, or the takeaway from this in general should be not to say that these systems don't have an effective implementation system or there is lack in the implementation system, but the take should be that there should be collaboration among all stakeholders, among all the organs, but also among the media, the civil society. And if we all collaborate and if we all uh, join our hands in terms of implementation, I think that's when we can move uh, forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Adam. And um, I think um, that, um, those are wonderful um, responses to the questions. And um, I would say with um, a robust um, question and answer session, I clearly see that um, we have really exhausted um, all that I have to say at the moment um, as regards this issue. And um, in the interest of time, we will um, simply skip the um, planned recap by our panelists because I really see that um, we have had a lot of um, robust engagement through the question and answer session. So um, at this point now, I would like to call on um, Professor Rachel Murray and um, Professor Franz Fiyum, um, the directors of the two institutions that have brought us together for this very wonderful webinar to give us um, their concluding remarks about um, this webinar. Um, I'll start with Prof Murray. Thank you, Felicio. Um, I won't say a great deal. I'm conscious that we are already over time. Um, but uh, the purpose of this webinar was to capture the current state of affairs in terms of what the three organs are doing around implementation. And I think it's, it's definitely achieved that. Um, I'd like to thank the speakers for their very detailed and rich presentations and for the extremely interesting chat from uh, everybody um, present here. Um, and just a personal thanks to the Center for Human Rights in Pretoria colleagues who have made this um, practically logistically feasible. So I'm going to finish there, but, but thank you so much. And we hope we'll be able to continue the conversations with you. Thank you very much, Prof. Murray. Um, Prof. Franz, your concluding remarks. Uh, thank you so much, um, Felucio, and everyone. Thanks again to everyone participating. Thank you. I join Rachel by thanking um, all our uh, wonderful speakers. I think it was like a masterclass. I think this recording sets out the terrain very, very expertly and is a wonderful resource. We really thank you for your time 
and your reflections captured in your presentations. I think it's a wonderful moment. We heard from each of these institutions, they are poised to really take implementation more seriously. We heard from the commission that the follow-up unit, which is foreseen in the strategic plan is now about to be really uh, operationalized. We've heard from the court that they're advertising for a senior legal officer who is going to be occupying him or herself with implementation. And we heard from the uh, committee that uh, from April, they will also have a working group that is focusing uh, specifically on, on implementation. So clearly a lot has been done, but I think it is really an opportune moment, a wonderful moment that we were all part of to see what the lay of the land is and to see, as Adiam said, how can we all involve ourselves in improving the lay of the land and making things work in the best possible way. So thank you all of you for, for saying um, you know, how things work and for setting out the challenges, but also giving us some, some sense of optimism. I want to just say for the participants, uh, this was really a very, very successful um, webinar. I counted at the height around uh, close to 260 participants. So uh, we thank you for your participation. We hope and trust that this has been useful to you. There's still about 150 at this late hour where we are 20 minutes beyond the time that we advertise. We really appreciate you taking time and being part of our discussion. I saw, and I'm sorry if I'm going to maybe just highlight two people. I think Justice um, uh, Ben Saula uh, has been mentioned, the just, uh, Justice also of the African Court on Human and People's Rights. We welcome you in particular. I see you were there and uh, we acknowledge you. And I also see Commissioner Hatem Essayen, who hails from Tunisia. We acknowledge you, sir, and we also really thank you very much. But I see he is a Commissioner Hatem is showing his uh, desire to make a, a small intervention. And we certainly will yield to that before we close. Uh, Commissioner Essayen. Thank you very much, Professor. I wanted to thank you for organizing uh, this uh, high level panel. And I think, I sincerely think that today's success is due to two things. Number one, the fact that French was used, especially because the commission was represented by two French speakers. And I would like to encourage you to continue on that line so that tomorrow we may have 300 or 400 participants. And sometimes I have to say, and I'm not hiding this, I would say that sometimes I did not participate in certain webinars because there was only one language that was used. So I would like to congratulate you for everything that you've been doing. Good luck to everyone. Um, thank you so much for that uh, encouraging words and also the acknowledgement. We um, actually, uh, the last on my list, in fact, uh, Commissioner Hatem, who is a commissioner of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, the last on my list is to just say thank you very much for our, our very competent and able moderator, for Lucio, for Michael, who assisted in the organization, Michael Nyarko, uh, obviously Rachel, who is our trusted and longstanding collaborating partner also in this event with the Human Rights Law Implementation. Um, project at the University of Bristol, and um, also the technical team, Yolanda, Taruna, and also Tatenda from the Center for Human Rights. You are unseen, but you really make us be seen. So thank you very much for your work behind the scenes. And lastly, our interpreters, we appreciate you. And as uh, Commissioner Atem said, you know, you make us also connect with each other. Thank you once again to everyone for being part of this. We look forward to each of us playing our role in improving the implementation of the decisions widely understood of the three institutions about which we talked about uh, this day. Thank you so much. Best wishes. Thank you very much, Prof. And um, with that, um, we have come to the conclusion and the end of this webinar. We hope to see you in future engagement. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye. <clears throat>